tardes a todos Good y todas. afternoon, everyone. I open here number three of the 184th period of session of the IACHR called uh, Human Rights of Persons Deprived of the Liberty and Their Family in Ecuador. It's, uh, it was called by the Permanent Committee of the Defense of Human Rights in Guayaquil. My name is Julissa Mantilla. I'm the president and I'm here with Estuardo Rallon, the first vice president and rapporteur for the persons deprived of their liberty. Also uh, the rapporteur of the rights for children, uh, Arasemena, and the rapporteur for the just for justice operators as well. We are here with the advisor, uh, Executive Secretariat, Maria Claudia Pulido, and also we have with us the representative of the OHCHR, Jan Charab. So greetings to him and the representatives of the civil society and the state. First of all, let me explain to you about the distribution of time. You will see a clock on the screen so that you can keep track of the time of your interventions. We will have 20 minutes for the civil society first, then the intervention of the state for 20 minutes. Mr. Jan Jarab will have seven minutes. After that, the commission will intervene for 20 minutes. We will have commentary from the civil society and the state and the state representatives for 10 minutes each, and then the closing of the session. We have interpretation, and we are streaming this over webcast, and we will have the recording on the channel of the commission. And please be aware of having your microphones off at, unless you are uh, speaking and introduce yourselves once you start speaking. We will begin with the civil society representatives. Go ahead. Good afternoon. We are here from the Permanent Committee for the Defense of Human Rights. I'm the legal representative, and it's a great honor for our organization to appear before you today on a situation that we consider the most serious situation among many others that infringe systematically the human rights of the Ecuadorian people and inhabitants and I'm referring to the prison population and the long crisis that we have of massacres and and cramping of people. We have been working for 40 years, specifically in the city of Guayaquil. We have registered a timeline over this time in which we identify different motivations, previous motivations uh, to the facts that are currently undergoing in the prisons of Ecuador. And there is a uh, an episode that happened before, which is the start of a new prison system in early 2010, where we saw the multiplication of the different uh, prison centers and we see a uh, reducing of the population in prisons, which uh, reaches to 9,000 people in prisons with this new model in 2010. And also there was an increase, um, extraordinary increase in relation with the, uh, with incarceration. There are 40,000 people in, in, in prisons in 2018. So the Committee uh, for the Defense of Human Rights has been registering extreme violence cases and also torture cases. In this period also, we observed a systematic restriction and generalized limitation to the work of human rights organisms in Ecuador, which has been have been prevented from working since 2010 inside the prisons. We have even witnessed a blockade to work with the Ombudsman in Ecuador, which is the entity that coordinates the mechanism for the prevention of torture acts. And the other element that I would like to highlight as a characteristic for this period, which comes prior to what is happening right now, 
is the constant criminalization of the family members of the persons deprived of their liberty, specifically through the practice of torture in relation with intimate uh, groping of women and uh, other persons deprived of their liberty. We have been denouncing, reporting this systematically. This has been uh, shown to the commission in previous occasions, and we consider that this is an element that is repeated because the state continues pointing to the families as the responsible of the traffic of illegal substances and weapons within the prisons. We have pointed out that the prison crisis is due specifically to the absence of control and oversight of the authorities from the state and not to the families that are being criminalized repeatedly. We believe that the official discourse over this topic is excusing itself, it's justifying itself in relation with uh, a war between different gangs and leaving outside is responsibility over the life and life integrity of the 40,000 people that are inside the prisons, which are being uh, affected by the gangs that work in complicity with the state authorities. Very well, uh, greetings. My name is Astillas. I thank the commission for having convened this session, especially I thank the families that are here with us today. My intervention will always only be a brief diagnosis on uh, the legal aspect in prisons. I think that you are quite aware of this due to the report on the situation of the persons deprived of, of their liberty that has already been issued by the commission. So this is just to inform the families mainly. There is a lack of institutionality in Ecuador to really execute a penitentiary policy. We have an institution that does not have the in budget that is needed to uh, formulate public policies. And also there is a mechanism for the prevention of torture acts and degrading acts, the ombudsman. And there was a petition that we posed before them to see what are the obstacles that they face to execute their functions. And they pointed out the fact about the budget. There is only five people within the institution that can act all throughout the Ecuador. And this also adds to the question of crisis that we are undergoing. So there is no comprehensive penitentiary policy and there is a prohibition. There's an impossibility to monitor what is happening in the prisons right now. Also, there is something that's new, which is an inf a report created by the execution, by the executive power that concludes that the reassimilation uh, re centers are not this type of centers. Are, are th they are prisons that turn into crime schools. And this is due to this uh, punishable system and chronically failing system. So there are different conditions of vulnerability suffered by persons deprived of, the, of their liberty, which matches the report issued by the commission. So in the face of that, we have made a petition to each public institution and other bodies from the state questioning their execution to be able to comply this recommendations by the commission. And so far we have only received information from the ombudsman, the council and the general uh, prosecution's office. The rest of the institutions have not provided any information. And we think that those recommendations are just being uh, left aside. We 
also uh, sent you some uh, presentations. We have sent your way, maybe we can share them now, but the state always re responded in a punishable, from a punishable uh, point of view. They have never presented a human rights based approach to address this topic. And also in terms of the assimilation of victims into society. So this is why the hearing will be focused specifically on the conditions of the persons deprived of their liberty and their families. Because these persons, as you all know, we will uh, delve deeper into their conditions. But maybe we can share the the slides that we sent your way via email. Otherwise, it's OK. So let's uh, continue with the uh, testimony of the family members. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you once again for this uh, session, for convening this hearing today. We are seeing right now that we are not being uh, that much ignored by the society. We are family members. I am Campusano. I am a family member of one of the persons that was murdered in the latest massacres that we've undergone here in Ecuador. There are many of us that have uh, made up this commission to try to find justice in the prisons. I have this loss of my loved one, and many of us have lost our family members. This massacres in prisons is, are not something that is new or novel. It's not recent. And it's not something that's ended. It's something that is continuous, that continues to happen right now. In the last few years, we have seen a wave, a tidal wave of massacres, of violence in the prisons that has been shown in the media, uh, people being burnt alive, being uh, cut. These are th things that ha we have lived, we have gone through, and many others have gone through before, and many others will live this same things in the future if we don't find a solution. Prison massacres is nothing but a consequence of mismanagement by the state. Prisons are a state service. Even though people that have committed uh, crimes are put there to, to assimilate them back into society, prisons are providing services, a service that must guarantee rights, right to life, right to a dignified life, among other rights. This is by the Constitution. So this state service is targeted at, must comply with the Constitution and international standards. If they do not do so, if they infringe rights, or if they miss, just not hear recommendations, the state service is not a proper service. And we see there is no control within prisons. We, we have seen videos in which there are weapons or where pavilions are being led and just managed by these gangs. We do understand that this is very complicated to control such an amount of people that are being deprived of, of their liberty due to overcrowding. This is, uh, of course, evident, but this is not an excuse to just uh, not do anything. So we have lived through sacrifice, economic sacrifice, as well as suffering, because in, all, in order to guarantee the safety of our family members, we have had to sell many of our assets, of our things, to guarantee the security, the safety of our family members, which should have been guaranteed by the authorities. But since they are not in control of the prison centers, we are being forced to negotiate the safety of our family members with persons that are devoted to these criminal acts. 
something else that is very important is that once this massacre occurred when the state did not absolute did not do absolutely anything there was a mistake there they did not guarantee the right to life and safety to our family members but they can uh, amend those mistakes they can ask the family members if they have uh, undergone uh, economic suffering or personal suffering but in not even in that case the state was present and when the massacres happened when we tried to obtain information there were persons from this community that two months afterwards did not have information on their family members yet uh, at first they told them well your family member is alive and then one month later they said well no your family member has been killed so family members are uh, were really played with this they were told something that was not true and this is affecting them physically and mentally the state did not uh, present itself to to try to amend its mistake it, it is not seeking to uproot the present the prison crisis and it's not doing anything it does not seek to fix the macro problem the violence within prison and does not seek to fix the micro problems which are the victims the family members so they are not doing absolutely anything so in that sense we believe that the state has made a enormous mistake and beyond seeing this as criticism or as something that can damage the name of the state to make it look incompetent just take this international uh, recommendations recommendations issued by international organizations to to improve the situation to put an end to the situation so that other persons in the future do not have to live through the same situations that we have lived through good afternoon i'm mirta preciado mother of one of the persons deprived of their liberty murdered last year in november this afternoon we will uh, have a dialogue with on this topic and it's very regrettable to go through this moment to to remember what happened last year because us as family members we are we feel powerless we feel horrible for having lost one of our loved ones in this case in the massacre i lost my son tyro who was barely 26 years old my son was one of the of the boys that was detained in that prison but we despite that we gathered together in this fight with the aim of trying to solve something to see how the state with these recommendations can can help us so that we can turn what we uh, lived through last year in something positive because the state here in ecuador is not guaranteeing human rights and despite the loss of our family members it's very regrettable to to know that other families will have to go through this as well to to live the same process that we went through it's very hard to to try to explain to you that losing a family member a loved one in this type of massacres is extremely painful and complicated because back then each of us the family members we have a history a story that we live through but however I was told that my son was alive on Pavilion 11 and other people told me that my son was dead, that was had been burned alive, that had been mutilated. So to me and to all the family members, 
this was very hard. We have joined, we have gathered to, to fight over this, to put an end to this. What has happened in Ecuador cannot happen again. So it's very good that you are concerned with this situation going on in Ecuador right now. I want to say to you that I am very grateful to you and then that this space has to be replicated so that we can reach an agreement to really see what we can do in Ecuador, how you can support our country and us as family members of our Brit persons deprived of the liberty. I want to ask you to not to, to support us to, to issue a recommendation to solve this problem that we have here in Ecuador. I want to tell you that all family members are very much affected. The children of the people that, was, that were dead, the mothers, the wives, all family members are, have been ripped apart. We don't want this to happen again in our country because that loss, we have not overcome that loss. And I think we will never overcome that loss because it was something that had never happened before in our country. So I really wanted to thank you and to encourage you to continue in conversation to see what we can do. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the civil society's intervention ends now. Thank you. And before um, giving the floor to the state, you don't have anything to thank to us. The commission is here uh, just uh, comply, complaining with its function. So the state, go ahead. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to kindly greet all the commissioners and all the representatives and the family members who have presented today. We have uh, paid special attention to the presentation and we want to express our solidarity. Distinguished commissioners, I would like to say that the situation of prisons is the matter that we are going to discuss today, the human rights of persons deprived of their liberty and their families in Ecuador. Um, we are concerned at the national government about this matter. The president of the Republic is well aware of the facts and the state of Ecuador is giving priority to this matters by paying a special emphasis on the follow-up of the situation of persons deprived of their liberty and their families in the prisons managed by the state in Ecuador. So on behalf of the state of Ecuador, we believe that this is a timely opportunity to address this matter. We are happy to have this space to discuss and to exchange perspectives and to work together to address this matter. Uh, for that, several representatives of uh, the state of Ecuador are here with us today, and I would like to introduce them and their institutions. First, the human rights secretary, that is the governing institution represented by Claudia Vanseca. She is a director of the promotion of human rights under that secretariat. We also have uh, the National Service of Comprehensive Attention to Persons Deprived of Their Liberty, which is known as S9 in our country, which is represented by Ana Maria Coronel, that is director of diagnosis and comprehensive development of the research reinsertion office and also mrs Rees, that is the subdirector of that office also the office of the attorney general is here today and 
Uh, it is represented by Maria Fernandez Alvarez, Human Rights Director of that institution, together with Carlos Espin and Alfonso Fonseca, who is a lawyer in that office, and also Dr. Mirela Tomato, that is also a lawyer in the prosecutor's office. On behalf of the Foreign Ministry, we have Secretary Anamelia Sansa, who is the director of the Inter-American System and subrogate offices within the Foreign Ministry. And on behalf of the Permanent Mission of Ecuador before the OAS, we have Sandra Cisalema, and who is in charge of following up these issues in our mission. Without further ado, um, distinguished commissioners, I would like to give the floor to Claudia Valseca. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Claudia Valseca. And first of all, I would like to thank civil society for their comments. We value them and we are well aware that the national system of social rehabilitation is something that we need to improve together. And all your comments and feedback will be welcome and taken into consideration for new policies and instruments. Secondly, I would like to talk about the public policy on social rehabilitation that was launched in February 2022. As it was mentioned before, the public policy before this one was a penitentiary policy. However, we wanted to update that policy and we wanted to design a public policy with a human rights perspective and persons deprived of their liberty are at the center of this new public policy. For us, it was important to build this policy together with the uh, with persons deprived of their liberty and all those persons involved in social rehabilitation. We conducted 160 working sessions with all the persons of the technical staff. We have 32 bilateral meetings with institutions to design this policy, 20 sessions with civil society and with academia, because it's important to include their perspective, which will be always different from that of the state. We also conducted nine visits to detention centers, and we met with several family members of persons deprived of their liberty and former persons deprived of their liberty. Uh, we wanted to know what they expected from this public policy. As a result of, this poly of all these meetings, the public policy was launched. It includes five dimensions and 308 lines of actions. The axes include health, work, education, social dimensions, rehabilitation, culture, sport, infrastructure, human resources, partnerships, uh, convenes, and also a specific chapter on adolescents deprived of their liberty. Once the policy was launched, and so it has several sections, we conducted 10 working sections, sessions to discuss the implementation of the public policy and the allocation of resources for this public policy. We determined three areas that should be prioritized. We use green that should be applied in 2022, um, then color yellow for 20. 23 and 2024 and red for 2025. So we have several actions. Uh, there are 80 actions that we're conducting in red in 2025 and the others will be conducted before. It's important to mention that this public policy is being implemented and followed up on at the high level of our ministries and also the technical offices that we lead. Also, it's important to say that to build these public policies, uh, we work together with other institutions. We received a consultant from the High Commissioner of Human Rights of the United Nations. Uh, this person came to Ecuador to work together so that we could include the international standards perspective in our public policy. And we also work on with experts on persons deprived of their liberty. We also had the collaboration of Impacted. They conducted several 
contributions and reviews of the public policy. And they held a consensus meeting that included stakeholders from civil society, from the executive branch, from uh, academia, to find solutions to the different issues identified in the social rehabilitation system at the national level. It's also important to mention that we have the visit of the IACHR in December 2021. We are conducting the legal analysis of the terms of the MOU signed together with the commission. We know that it would be very important that the commission supports us so that we take the necessary steps so that we achieve true social rehabilitation. That is all in my end as human rights secretary. So now I would like to give the floor to my colleagues. Good afternoon, Madam President, commissioners of civil society, family members of persons deprived of their liberty. Together with my colleague, Pablo Ramirez, we would like to greet the all of you and we thank you for this space to build together an effective rehabilitation system for persons deprived of their liberty in our country we would like to share with you some information on the penitentiary system in our country we would like to share some slides to give you some specific data can you see my screen yes it's fine With regard to the penitentiary population and its evolution in recent years, it's important to take into consideration the fact that the highest peak of penitentiary population was in 2019 with a population of over 33,000 people. Uh, so of June 2022, we have in our 36 detention centers at the national level, we have 30,000 men and 2,000 women deprived their liberty. Why this is important? Because between 2019 and today, there has been a decrease in penitentiary population. What this night has done to deal with those persons that are for many years in the penitentiary system. It's important uh, to recognize the weaknesses of the system. And the first action is to promote institutional strengthening. Since the creation of SNI, we did not have a structure. A few uh, months ago, an um, institutional management model was approved. And with this model, we will have more institutionality and create procedures to have sounder rehabilitation processes. Another way of promoting institutionality has to do with direct participation in the National Assembly to develop regulations and norms. We are concerned about the law on the legitimate use of force. And therefore, this uh, unit needs to have more resources to be effective in the penitentiary system. We also created 150 indicators of management and results. And this is to improve the performance of the different sectors and divisions who work in the in penitentiary system. This seems something simple, but in the penitentiary system, there was no indicator about how we were doing things. It's an administrative issue that is proving effective because we are measuring the weaknesses that we have in our system. Another important aspect in which we are working is the strengthening of the security and surveillance body. We have always mentioned that security agents in penitentiary systems are um, uh, in deficit against or taking into consideration the penitentiary population that we have. This is an assessment made by several international organizations, but we did not take actions to improve this aspect. Since April, 2022, we have a process to train 1400 new police or security officers or agents. 
And this includes training together with uniforms and equipment for new security agents. Also, we are trying to empower our officials so that they conduct their work in a proper way. In addition, we have we are buying equipment, for example, helmets, gloves, um, lights, and the budget for that is eight hundred thousand dollars. We have included the budget for each of these measures so that it's clear that the state of Ecuador is investing in the system, especially after the violent crisis that we had in the penitentiary system. The state has made emphasis on improving or allocating money in the penitentiary system. And that's why we are showing you figures regarding the budgets that we have. Another aspect is to improve the existing infrastructure in the penitentiary centers. Many of the centers are 30 or 40 years old and um, under the administration of Pablo Ramirez, we are purchasing construction materials to improve detention centers with a budget of $900,000. We are also improving the perimeter security of the penitentiary centers. We have a budget of $5 million. We are making a special emphasis in these centers in Guasha, Santa Domingos, Manabí, and Esmeraldas. And we're also building a perimeter wall in Guasha's number two. That is a female detention center. This is to improve security measures, and this will increase the well being of persons deprived of their liberty. Another aspect has to do with increasing the security and protection in penitentiary centers in the country. We have an integrated system of two rooms to monitor uh, in order to strengthen the control of detention centers. We have a budget of $1.4 million. .4 million. We are also purchasing more technology and we have a budget of $750,000 for that. Regarding uh, or taking into consideration these institutional needs, on May the 27, 2022, we have a state of emergency declaration. So as a result, we can conduct three activities. Among these activities, there are three which are more the most important, the implementation of an IT system for biometric administrative records and penitentiary management. This is to improve the penitentiary system. Why is it important? We all know that in the penitentiary system, the most important weakness has to do with information management. Without information, we cannot grant timely information about what's happening in the peniten penitentiary centers. And this is one of the main uh, recommendations of the IACHR in its report. We need to have true information on the procedural status of persons deprived of their liberty. That's why we need to have timely information. The IT system has a budget of $3 million. We are now doing the hiring process in order to be able to execute this system. Also, in order to reduce the population or the overcrowding in detention centers, overcrowding is a negative center. It's a negative factor in detention centers. We created the Proyecto Renacer, which implies hiring 100 professionals. Uh, this includes psychologists, lawyers, social workers, and support assistants in order to improve or to provide penitentiary benefits uh, for people. Due to the lack of personnel in the system, we were not able to provide those benefits. This project will help us um, streamline the benefits for persons deprived of their liberty. 
how can we reinforce this process? Together with the IT system and with the project of Renacer, we are digitalizing all the files and all the information. This will help us to have a more efficient system to access information on the penitentiary system in a faster way. Also, this nice working to improve food processes in penitentiary centers across the country. We know that food is always a controversy. We are dividing the system into three territories. On the map, we have the north, that will be a sector that will cover 11,000 persons deprived of their liberty. Then we have a second sector in the south part of the country covering 9,000 people. And then we have a third section uh, which covers 13,000 people. How are we trying to reduce overcrowding in detention centers? The state of Ecuador and the president of the Republic issued three presidential decrease on pardons. We have the first from November 2021, especially for those people who have terminal diseases. And the last decree is from February 2022 for minor crimes. As you can see in the table, nine people have received the benefits of these three pardons. And over 300 people were released this year because of the benefits of the decrease. All these actions can be verified in this table. We see a 17% reduction of overcrowding in five months. However, you can see that this is a positive activity to reduce overcrowding in order to humanize the conditions of persons deprived of their liberty. Overcrowding is a factor that does not promote social rehabilitation. By lowering overcrowding, we are trying to improve the penitentiary system. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you to the representatives of the state. So now we will listen to the to Mr. Chancharab for seven minutes. Madam President, Commissioners of the IACHR, representatives of the states and the civil society, everyone here present, present today, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here again representing the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations and to participate on this hearing on the human rights of persons deprived of the liberty and their family in Ecuador. My presentation will be aimed at understanding the problems of the penitentiary system in Ecuador. In a great part of Latin America, the penitentiary systems uh, suffer many problems, not only in Ecuador, material conditions that in many times could be themselves considered uh, inhuman or degrading treatment, the lack of access to measures of rehabilitation into society and difficulties such as uh, the right to health, water, labor, work, etc and the constant increase of the number of pe people being deprived of their liberty resulting in overcrowding due to measures that are uh, over punitive, specifically in terms of drugs that affect the most marginalized sectors of society and that are also creating an unprecedented increase in terms of the deprivation of liberty of uh, the female population, these characteristics shared by other countries in the region show that there have been a series of events that can be characterized in Ecuador as a massacre. And this makes Ecuador's situation become specifically dramatic. This is a as an issue of security and also of human rights because guaranteeing the protection of the right to life of people being under custody is an obligation of the state. Losing one's life in an act of extreme violence cannot be part of their 
sentence and the family members have the right to justice and reparation. Investigations have to ensure accountability, not only on the part of the material uh, authors, but also intellectual authors of the crimes and also on the part of the public uh, officials that are that were in power at the time, but also despite of reparation and research, we need structural changes. Alongside with our uh, the UNDC, we drafted a diagnosis of the penitentiary system in Ecuador, alongside a roadmap for a comprehensive reform that was sent to the Ecuadorian authorities. In great part of our recommendations, we also are in agreement with other international experts. Let me highlight one some of our findings. In 13 years, the number of people being deprived of their liberty was uh, increased thri thrice fold. And this trend has to be addressed, uh, had to do with a policy that was, that managed to reduce part of that number. But however, as recent tragic events show, the solution was not successful. The recently position of the United Nations on this type of issues highlights that these problems in prison centers cannot be solved by building new prisons and incarcerating an increasingly a number of people. I don't want to oversimplify because the causes of the different massacres are uh, diff uh, different and, and very numerous, but it is, uh, it is good to say that this happened in large prisons, which should have been a solution. And actually, it's been proven that these large prisons do not favor rehabilitation or assimilation into society because they are usually far away from urban centers and difficult the contact of being of persons deprived of their liberty with family members and friends and they are hard to monitor and they usually fall under the control of organized crime so the uh, aforementioned roadmap has four pillars one of them has to do with uh, drafting a new public policy of rehabilitation and in this context i want to recognize the willingness of the Equatorian uh, authorities that invited our office to draft this new policy. And there was a consultation of uh, several agents, so we were able to contribute to have this policy be human rights based. We are convinced that this is a promising document. We appreciate the fact that uh, funds were allocated to this public policy and we also value the measures that are being taken to reduce overcrowding and we consider this as an advancement and as well as the recent adoption of the law on the legitimate use of force but we do understand however that public policies require follow-up and a coordinate effort for its implementation so that it does not only rest in paper on paper it has to be internalized by a large range of actors first of all the national system the comprehensive system on uh, on persons deprived of their liberty, night, among others. Also, we understand that public policies on rehabilitation is only one of the four pillars of what has been identified as necessary for a comprehensive reform. We also need to advance in the rest of the pillars. The security within the system is one of them, because if we do not guarantee the minimum conditions of security and implementation of this policy for rehabilitation is almost impossible. Also, we need to improve the management of the system, the efforts to combat corruption and the need to reduce overcrowding. When we speak about the necessary reduction of overcrowding, I let me say that we are not in favor of continuing doing this through building new penitentiary centers. This path can even lead to more problems and solutions. So what our office supports is a change in penitentiary policies to reduce 
the use of preventive prison to um, to reduce sentences to try to use and um, policies that are not uh, do not deprive people of their liberty i let me congratulate the commission and the state to uh, for having accompanied the civil society and the victims on this thank you for your attention thank you john Charab. now we have the inter-american commission's intervention first of all let me give the floor to the first vice president rapporteur for ecuador commissioner suardo Rallon. Thank you very much, Madam President. Good afternoon, colleagues, the team of the Executive Secretariat, the people of civil society, the representative of the United Nations, Jan Jarab, and the representatives of the state. Let me begin by acknowledging the intervention of the different persons of the civil society, and especially I want to give you show you my solidarity to the families of the violent acts on in prisons it's a very brave testimony you have given in your intervention this shows undoubtedly that what has happened in prison centers has transcended has impacted many families many mothers siblings, children. And on top of addressing the structural problem of the prison crisis as such, it is necessary for us to have a dialogue, to engage in communication with the state as regards civil society members and family members with the aim of addressing this impact and the necessary to give the necessary support even a support in terms of the reality of the effects of this regrettable act the state should have been the protector of those rights and many people lost their lives under their custody on the other hand i wanted to acknowledge what the state has pre presented some of the measures and new policy for rehabilitation that has been enforced for four months and also that over the last six months overcrowding has been reduced around by 17 percent compared to the 10 percent figure in the last in the previous 10 years and the presentation made by the SNAI representatives is a good summary, the PowerPoint that they have presented, and it's information that you have sent to the commission so that we can have it and we can have it as an input to analyze such a serious situation. Also, let me uh, tell you that there is a commitment on the part of the Inter-American Commission to continue monitoring and following up with the recommendations uh, issued on the last report as regards the prison crisis, I had the opportunity to go to Ecuador and we observed structural uh, failures and we saw the state was willing to provide support, technical support. In fact, there were some decisions made from December to date. And in the last meetings with the state representatives beyond this hearing, we were able to discuss how we could effectively implement that technical support and assistance to try to solve some of these uh, failures within the prison system. So I wanted to re reiterate our commitment. We are available and willing to support and we hope that we can achieve this and uh, put an end to this serious situation also i would like to ask a question both for the representatives of the civil society organizations and the state which is if you can tell us how 
much is the dialogue open if there is a sort of uh, coordination or dialogue table so that this presented as a necessity can be addressed and understood and have some sort of um, monitoring or follow-up uh, methodology. I, as I understood, the civil society was petitioning, was demanding that this, the state has, uh, takes more, more responsibility on this issue. So, for example, paying for the safety of the persons that are incarcerated in the face of the lack of action on the part of the state and also the impact on the family members of those who lost one of their loved ones in this prison crisis. So there are many aspects which must be heard and organized in some sort of work methodology so that the state is closer to such a serious situation. So the question would be if within the measures that you have implemented over the last few months, are there any opportunities? Are those channels open for communication? Or if not, what is your position in terms of implementing something of the sort? Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Arasamena, do you have any comments or questions? Thank you very much, Madam President. Just one comment, my greetings to everyone. And as Equatorians say, uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon. I wanted to express my solidarity for the family members of the victims that have presented their testimony today. I wanted to thank the state representatives for their openness. And let me just mention one of the elements that was uh, also pointed out by Commissioner Stuardo. Both parties in this space, and this is the value of the Inter-American Commission's hearings, this is a space for dialogue, for dialogue. And both the civil society and the state have used this importance of dialogue, of communication, of working together. So I encourage you to translate this into an effective space for participation with civil society, precisely to address an issue that is definitely complex. And also a comment and a question I would like to have an answer from both the civil society and the state. So this uh, demand by family members of receiving support in terms of uh, social and psychological health to face such serious impacts, which are, which are this, uh, the result of this experiences that they have gone through. So is this, working right now is this being implemented just to create this space of communication we have to seek an answer to this as a priority thank you very much commissioner hernandez you have the floor thank you madam president good uh good afternoon everyone also i greet the family members of the persons deprived of the liberty. Uh, I express my solid solidarity to you. I think the topics have been uh, brought to the table. We have to highlight the state's cooperation to address this crisis in such an open and transparent way by resorting to international organisms, including this commission, which as we know, conducted a visit led by Commissioner Estuardo Rallon last year. And one month later, there was already a report that had been issued with a very specific recommendation. What I would like to highlight of this conversation is preventive prison. 
we have heard about the measures implemented by the state to improve the conditions in detention centers. I think all of them are positive. This is one of the main obligations of the state, which is to guarantee a dignified treatment towards the people deprived of their liberty. The, the state is the guarantor of that right. So these measures will always be welcome. But the topic, the most important thing was very much uh, well pointed out by Jan Chura, which is it's not possible to solve the penitentiary crisis by only building new facilities. We have to go to the root of this, which is prison itself. Prison should be the last resort and the obligation on the part of the state to seek alternative measures. The reprieves, the, the pardons that you have reported on, are necessary to reduce overcrowding. You have given us the number uh, around 17% has, has been reduced in terms of these numbers, but I imagine then the figures continue to be high. So I would like to know if within this policies that you are implementing, if there is uh, prison, uh, you especially especially preventive prison is being taken into account and whether if this is being addressed from the perspective of resorted to alternative measures with the aim of having preventive uh, having deprivation of liberty being the last resort the commission has worked very hard on this issue there are different manuals and guidelines to address this topic. So that would be all, Madam President, thank you. Thank you first. Uh, let me apologize for the noise that you can hear on my background, but I wanted to start by showing solidarity to the family members of those who died in the circumstances, all of you who are here and all of those who are not here today, but are, but are still leak, looking for preparation. Also, thank you for the state and the information. I have some specific questions. The civil society spoke of circumstances of uh, bodily groping uh, on family members and, de and women deprived of their liberty. I, I wanted to see if you have any more details on this and if you have initiated research investigation on this type of things and what measures are you being implement are you implementing and also i'm very much concerned on the situation of women deprived of their liberty in relation to this everything that has to do with their sexual and reproductive health gynecological health children issues in case uh, women are being incarcerated with small children and the impact on their family and specifically mrs preciado told us about how this situation has affected all families and i wanted her to and also the other uh, young man if you could say what are the reparation measures that you have seen? What are you demanding? What are you expecting? And what could be established here today with a state which is very much willing today? So having said that, I give the floor to Maria Secre to Secretaria uh, Claudia Pulido. Thank you, Madam President. It's an honor to be here today and to hear firsthand the family members of the victims and the delegates of the state. I would like to make two comments. First, as Commissioner Rolón was saying, in April 28, we sent a proposal to offer technical cooperation to the state of Ecuador. And this includes several things. One, something on uh, penitentiary population. Two, uh, regarding the institutionality of the penitentiary system. Third, social rehabilitation and in reinsertion and for a prevention of violence. What's important about these access or aspects is that we would like also to give reparations to the victims of violence. We would like to say that we are also 
paying special attention to any questions that the state authorities may have. And my second comment has to do with a question. The state has provided information regarding the measures adopted by the SNAI. And my question is the following, given that this is a structural crisis that is related to other areas of the state, it would be good to know which measures other entities, including the Supreme Court of Justice, the Public Prosecution Office, have been adopted. This includes measures regarding penitentiary benefits and also um, the request of release, the sentences and any other related measures. Also, it's important to know that the National Congress has an important role regarding the classification of crimes and the benefits and the flexibility to give benefits by judicial authorities. That will be all at, me end, at my end, Madam President. I would like to give the floor to Soledad Garcia Munoz. Do you have any comments or questions? Thank you, Madam President. I have a question to make. What are the main challenges that civil society organizations and family members and the state are identifying in terms of rights to health? We have uh, gone through a pandemic and we know the complexity or the complex issues created by the pandemic in the region, especially also access to food and to water for persons deprived of their liberty, especially for those people that do not have a livelihood to pay for their food. Thank you, Rapporteur. I would like now to give the floor to civil society for 10 minutes. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. I would like to mention some important aspects uh, regarding what the representatives of the state pointed out. First, uh, you were asking about the possibility of participating in the plans and giving an adequate response to the penitentiary crisis. The Secretariat of Human Rights invited us and we are one of the actors um, and we are working together with the Secretariat on the plan presented by the Secretariat of Human Rights. But that's all. There has been no other steps in that regard. And this is something that we need to highlight very clearly. There has been no other measures in that regard. Everything that has to do with implementation of the agreements and the implementation of the plans to overcome the penitentiary crisis, we have not participated in them. We believe that implementation or the allocation of the resources is a process that is a still a promise. And this is related to the lack of mechanisms to promote this. In spite of the exception um, measures that could have helped us to implement measures we have resorted to requesting information. Only a few institutions of the state provided us with that information. The Public Prosecution Office and the Ombudsperson Office have provided us with information and the commission. But we went to justice to request information on the situation of the population in prison. We don't believe in the figures that are being presented today because there is no certainty on the number of penitentiary population. We don't know who is living in each ward. And the commission went to Ecuador after the massacre and that's all the information that we have. We have also go to justice in terms of the health attention of persons deprived of their liberty. Also, we have complained because 
we don't believe that the state is providing responses to those persons who have chronic or terminal diseases. This could be a possibility for being granted a preventive detention, but those things are not happening. In some random way or in a discretionary way, some measures or some releases have been granted. And these measures have favored political actors and leaders of criminal organizations. Um, persons deprived their liberty have not received psychological support. And those pardons, pardons have not proved effective, taking into consideration the number of people who have benefited from those pardons. Pardons have been granted to people who drive cars um, with some specific type of uh, tires. I'm talking because there is only a few people who have had access to these pardons. I think that the problem has to do with the speed and the commission has talked about this. I think that their connection has, they have lost their connection. Um, please, I would like to ask the team to verify with civil society organizations if they are able to come back or not. I think that they lost connection, maybe, Madam President. I think that it's good to give the floor to the state and then to give the floor back to the to civil society. So the state has the floor for five minutes, for 10 minutes. Thank you. I would like to address super important aspects. Then one of them is openness to dialogue. As civil society was mentioning, they participated in the design of the public policy. Effectively, once the public policy was designed, no other meetings with civil society have been, been held because we are implementing those policies. We are doing all or creating all the mechanisms to implement the public policy. However, we are open to dialogue and to participate in any meeting to follow up on any requests that civil society organizations may have. Also, we can have a biannual meeting with civil society. Implementation is super important. So the information that they can provide us with is super important. It would be good to have a discussion on all the things that we want to do or what we are planning to do regarding the implementation of the policy. So we are open to dialogue to continue with the implementation process. With regard to psychological support, I would like to say that uh, when uh, there are uh, this crisis, uh, there are some protocols that are activated. The Secretariat of Human Rights provides emotional support and psychological support to persons deprived of their liberty. But uh, if family members request so, this should be dealt with by other uh, institutions, for including the Minister of Public Health. Also, um, these organizations provide information, records, and also a lot of support and activities cover and that are implemented when a person dies. And in terms of reparation, the Council of Citizen Participation and Social Control has uh, been working. We have held two or three meetings and this includes civil society and the executive branch to find better reparation measures. And with regard to the right to health, of course, we will always concern, will be always concerned. We know that the right to health is a strategic part of public policies and regarding medical attention, the 
provision of medication for persons deprived of their liberty. And the president tried to prioritize all the health actions in the public policy and to locate the resources for the implementation of any health related aspect. And the resources for the health aspect will be sooner than for other areas. With regard to the other questions, I would like to give the floor to the member of the SNI so she can answer those questions. Uh, on behalf of the SNI, we would like to say that we are open to dialogue and to working together with civil society and the family members of persons deprived of their liberty. We also believe that it's important to listen to their feedback to know what's happening in the prisons. And therefore, we are creating a mail of integrity and transparency that is focused on family members of prisons deprived of their liberty and family members will be able to send their complaints and reports on what's happening within the penitentiary system. We believe that that process will improve transparency internally and we want that this is a method for family members to convey their needs. With regard to information, and the reduction in the population of the penitentiary system, we know that information management is a problem. And that's why we are working on two ways. First, it has to do with having IT system for the penitentiary system in order to have social, social demographic information on the legal situation of persons deprived of their liberty. We are now buying equipment and we are working with the forensic office. And at the same time, we are also working to purchase uh, equipment to digitalize information on the penitentiary system. This will help us to have information immediately and in order to uh, keep this information for the long term, we are trying to work together so that this digitalized information is included in the IT system that is being developed. And in the presentation, we also have information regarding the purchase of equipment to review all the persons who enter detention centers. This includes police officers, legal officers, lawyers, family members, technicians, all every person that enters a prison uh, will be recorded. Everything will be in a record. There are several technological methods that are being purchased and several technical reviews have been taken so as not to affect the health of the persons deprived of their liberty. This is a technical process. And it's also important to mention that the state of Ecuador is well aware of the diagnosis of the issues in the system, but we can see that at a global level, uh, changes in the penitentiary system are not quick. We are talking about persons who live in the system. And as it was mentioned before, we have criminal structures in the systems and those structures cannot be eliminated all of a sudden. We, for sustained change, we need time. And therefore we thank uh, the ISHR for their cooperation. We are eager to collaborate in, we believe that cooperation is very important and we thank the technical cooperation offered by the ISHR. Thank you so much. Uh, has the state finished, completed its presentation? I now would like to give the floor back to civil society. You will have the time that you had for the, your intervention. You can go ahead. Thank you so much. Sorry for the interruption. I would like to give some answers regarding the responses of the state. Sometimes it's complicated to implement an integral public policy if the executive branch has a um, punishing approach, not only in terms of public policies, but in terms of legislation. 
we believe that the mail is not a participatory method to know what is happening in prison. We believe that the participation in different spaces that articulate the role of civil society, family family members and the state is what we need. We also believe that it's important that the penitentiary system information should be digitalized. A superficial census will be just a picture. And we cannot isolate the penitentiary crisis from the massacres. The massacres are the final results of the crisis. A uh, crisis occur when people do not know how to access benefits and there is crisis when there, are, when there is overcrowding in prisons. I will try to be fast because of time restraints. For family members, uh, or family members, we have not received anything from the state. I would love for the state to be concerned for us, the family members who lost our loved ones. We have received any type of psychological support, which should be a priority. The state has been an entity that did not show the interest that we wanted them to have. We lost a family member, but the state has not helped us. They did not provide psychological support for our family. They didn't ask what they could do for us family members. All of a sudden, the person who died had a son or a daughter so where's the state to assume responsibility and to provide support for this child so that that child can continue to study and to get food? Why? Where is the state? Why the state is not telling us? You can count on us. I lost my son. And it is buried at a mountain. And I would love for the state to give me a place uh, I can visit and I can go to see my son and said, my son is in a dignified place. So we want more from the state. We want much more because what has happened is something that should not have happened. And this is for the state you are responsible for the massacres that we experienced last year. And we know that these massacres still occur in the different detention centers in Ecuador, because this is not happening in Guayaquil only. It is occurring at the national level in Ecuador. Thank you so much. I will be very quick. I would like to make emphasis on the fact that we have not received the support or any help from the state. And they are trying to fix this penitentiary crisis without taking into account the family members who have already suffered because of this crisis. Uh, when we look at the plan that they are proposing that they have shared with you today, the state is seeking a system to eradicate the prison crisis, but the plan is not taking into consideration family members, those who have suffered the penitentiary crisis and its results. Through um, When we look at the plan, we realize that we are not being included in the plan. And I think that using uh, the argument of the penitentiary crisis and saying that this is something that is very complex to face because there are organized gangs, I think that that is not very promising. And we uh, need to have expectations. And therefore, family members should be considered in this plan. We should not be ignored. And we would like to take the most of, uh, to make the most of this space to uh, encourage the state to hold a meeting, to be heard. Uh, we need to have responses from them.
Thank you, representatives of the civil society. We are concluding with this hearing. I want to express the commitment and the solidarity with the families that you, my colleagues and myself, from, and also to to all of you, to all of you and all of those who are represented by you. The issue of dignity, a person can be deprived of their liberty, but they can never be deprived of their uh, dignity. So in that sense, the Inter-American Commission is here to facilitate any space of dialogue or exchange that may be needed and also to reach a solution. As the representative Jandra uh, said, the issue of ju justice and reparation and truth are essential on what we are discussing today. Any other additional information that you have not been able to present today, you can send it uh, to us. I had uh, asked some specific questions as regard women onto the state, and it would be very valuable to have that information. Also, we made a petition to the uh, Inter-American Court on a differential approach on persons who bribed of the liberty, and this advisory opinion was issued by the court on the situation and i think will be very much useful this differential approaches for persons deprived of their liberty as part of standards inter-american standards so we conclude with this hearing thank you once again we are available for anything that you may need for uh, all of the commissioners that address different topics at this commission and that work on such a big challenge on human rights of persons as the universal declaration of human rights says that all persons are born equal in terms of dignity and so we need to continue aiming at that so thank you very much i conclude with this hearing and have a great afternoon see you see you soon